Hi everybody, welcome back. I um, hope you found the IBD session as fascinating as I did. It's been a really great day so far. We now have the bowel cancer research session, which is going to be chaired by Georgia Sturt. So Georgia, I'm now going to hand over to you. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Big Bowel event with Bowel Research UK. I'm Georgia Sturt and I'm the Research and Grants Manager at Bowel Research UK. I'm delighted to introduce the session on the latest research in bowel cancer. We have a really, really interesting range of topics for you today. So our speakers for this session will be Rima Hazer on bowel cancer and health inequalities, Dr. Tom Pampiglioni on new technology in colorectal surgery, and Eamon Dunn on visual impairment and bowel cancer screening. So first up, we have Rima. Her pronouns are she, her, and she identifies as a queer woman of colour and works as an equality, diversity and inclusion lead in the NHS. Prior to this, Rima sent, spent several years working on bowel cancer risk reduction in marginalised communities across the UK. She currently provides postgraduate lectures, lectures on screening and health inequalities. Rima has also had strategic and advisory roles in health and wellbeing. Her academic background in psychology is in psychology and she has several years of experience in frontline mental health work in minoritized communities. In her spare time, Rima enjoys a healthy and active vegan lifestyle and is vocal about the equal human rights of marginalized people through various forms of activism. Rima, we're delighted to have you joining us today and over to you. Thank you very much, Georgia. I'm just gonna share my screen, just one second. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Rima Hazem, my pronouns are she, her, as you just heard. Um, so I'm EDI lead at North East London Foundation Trust, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, Tom, are you all right to step up to the plate? I can see you raise your hand, Tom. That's very generous of you. Hi, yeah, so um, uh, I'm Tom Pampaglioni. I'm a research fellow at University College London. Uh, and a surgical registrar at University College Hospital. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how we might implement new technology in colorectal cancer surgery um, at each stage of a patient's journey. I think um, just before we start, uh, I just want to say that I don't have any financial, um, oh, sorry, uh, interest in any of the companies that I'm mentioning. They're just the ones that I'm familiar with. Um, and also it's important to mention that some of the research and technology presented is at the research stage. So um, it might still look a bit rough around the edges. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to talk about how uh, technology is used at each stage of a patient's journey. Um, and, and then uh, along the way, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, virtual reality and robotic surgery. I think it's, it's a good way to do this is to, to um, start with a case study. It's a fairly typical picture. Some uh, people may be familiar with, um, for example, Bob, 75 year old man, has gone to see his GP with some lower abdominal pain and blood in his stool. Um, his GPs referred him on a two week wait pathway to the hospital. Um, a typical management plan for, for a patient like this would be that they would have some form of endoscopic investigation like a colonoscopy. And then they may go on to have imaging uh, and possibly surgery with, with a recovery afterwards. And at each stage along the way, there are opportunities to use AI uh, or new technology. And, and I'll discuss a few examples. <clears throat> but before we begin, um, for those that don't know, what, what, what is artificial intelligence? Um, it's a term that's often used in the media um, very commonly. Um, uh, and... Um, and it can be a bit vague. And the, and the reason it is a bit vague is because it doesn't really mean one specific thing. It's not one specific process. It's, it's a, more of a concept. But it can be broken down to any sort of process where a computer replicates human behavior. And typically that's some form of uh, input like text, data, sound, images. The computer algorithms will then make a prediction or answer based upon the information it's provided with. Sometimes there are opportunities for that um, thought process to refine itself. And, and, and that's where we we can um, have things like machine learning you might have heard of um, and some other concepts. So <clears throat> AI is a reasonably broad topic. Um, what I've just mentioned is probably would be described as machine learning. But other things we use in healthcare are things like computer vision. That's where AI can use images or video to, to make a decision or to recognize things. And natural language processing is a place where um, 
you give text to an AI and then it can read it and analyze it and also make decisions upon it. <clears throat> so back to back to our case study, Bob. Um, Bob, he's, he's been seen in one of the hospital clinics and they've decided that he needs to have a colonoscopy. And, and this is the first place where we can use some form of AI to try and improve our diagnosis. One of the main problems with AI is, I'm um, sorry, with colonoscopy is that we might miss something. Um, polyps are very small. And, and if you have lots of them or, or lots of food residue inside, things might be missed. So we can use AI to, um, to try and help with our polyp detection rate. So I'm going to show a video now of, um, of a colonoscopy. So this is the inside of a colon. Um, and on the left, you can see the scope guide, which uses magnets so that the endoscopist can know where they are in the colon. And what the AI has to do is try and find a polyp amongst the normal bowel lining and also the food residue. So what you can see here in a second is the AI will notice a polyp and that can help to uh, and then that can help the endoscopist make a decision about whether they want to biopsy or not. Uh, another thing that um, we can use AI for is any um, imaging that might be used as part of the diagnostic pathway. Most patients will undergo some form of CT scan or MRI uh, as part of their workup if they if they have a positive biopsy at their colonoscopy. Um, in this example, we uh, have taken a CT scan and you can see the liver is highlighted in uh, purple. And then we've used uh, an algorithm to reconstruct the 2D images, which a, CD, a CT scan is made up of many um, horizontal slices of a patient. And these can be reconstructed to make 3D renderings. And this is important because it can help us um, uh, define the anatomy. It can tell us if any other structures are involved um, or if there are any abnormal variations. So on the left is the raw image and on the right is a rendered image, um, which, which is a bit nicer really um, and easier to read. So like I mentioned before, this is particularly useful in the preoperative planning stage. Uh, if patients are gonna go on to have surgery, we can review their anatomy. Um, so the next, I'm going to show a video now of one of Mr. Chan's previous fellows who, who constructed these images, and he's going to talk about the process of how he made them. I probably need to share, do I need to share my sound? We can hear it, but it's quite quiet, so you might need to turn up your volume. Do I? Okay. And please remember everybody else can turn the volume up at home as well. So if you can't hear, let's do ourselves. Well, we must first select each structure in turn and manually draw around the outline from every slice that we expect to find in the CT scan. Once this is done, for every slice in which we expect to find that organ, we have created a full three-dimensional volumetric rendering and be added to the model. Here, come. Here we can see the original CT scan of the patient with each of the selected structures now highlighted in a different color throughout the entire scan. These structures are then combined to form the initial three-dimensional model. This initial model shows all of the selected structures as well as their relevant positions towards each other and can be fully interrogated in three dimensions in all six degrees of freedom. Although this creates no new information, by converting the two-dimensional CT DICOM data into a more familiar three-dimensional format, the anatomy is more easily understood. So, um, like I mentioned, if a patient does go on to have surgery, we can use these images uh, to improve our knowledge of the anatomy. And we can also use it to augment our display in the operating theater with the use of virtual reality. Uh, and augmented reality. So um, augmented reality is a process where you take the real environment, what you can see normally, and you combine it with virtual reality elements, which are purely synthetic and overlay them on top of each other. So the next video is an, uh, before a procedure and it shows how we might display a patient's anatomy to help us uh, in an operation. On the patient, bony landmarks. And those bony landmarks help with the manual um, alignment of the model. As you can see from the model, we have the important structures clearly demonstrated. The optimal working distance is about two feet. You can see the rectum in the middle, 
Around that, the green markings show the tumor itself and the extent of the tumor. This is thought to be at a distance of five centimeters on the MRI scan at the junction of the distal and the middle thirds of the rectum. I'm going to show another example now of how we can uh, show anatomy during an operation. Um, the uh, One of the problems we have is that before an operation, the images are taken, they're static. So if we move something like the colon or the bowel during a procedure, the images won't move with it. So the next evolution for this process is to try and work out how we can um, move the augmented images um, as we move the patient. So um, that involves knowing what things are. So on the left, you'll see where um, as the camera moves, the location of certain structures moves with it. So we know that they stay in place. And on the right, you can see how um, as the liver is moved, the um, the mesh which forms over it also moves. So by that way, we can use we can manipulate our augmented reality overlay so that we can find our find the relevant um, anatomical structures. Uh, I think I'm going to we'll go past that one. So so we. Um, one of the other ways that we we use AI and and, it, and the new platform that I'm sure lots of people have heard about is in in robotic surgery. Um, it's a new it's not a it's not a particularly new technique in some fields. It's been certainly been used in the US for a long time, but it's becoming more um, used in the United Kingdom. Um, it's a process where uh, it's the same as in some ways laparoscopic surgery. It's a minimally invasive technique. Uh, it's not autonomous. The robot doesn't operate itself. There's a human operator but they sit at a console away from the patient. And then there's an assistant which sits next to the patient and controls the arms and what instruments are used. Um, I'm gonna show an example of some robotic surgery now. And one of the main benefits of robotic surgery is that you have a greater ability to manipulate the instruments inside. So instead of using straight instruments, they, they can be, they have a greater degree of freedom to move. And another benefit is we can begin to incorporate elements of augmented reality um, with the robotic platform. If, if you look below, uh, there is an image overlay that tells you what instruments are being used um, and also tells the position of the camera, but we can use it for other information. So in the next video, um, uh, this patient has been provided, um, administered with a radioisotope. So that's a very low count of radiation, which goes to the lymph nodes. And that helps us during the operation find the lymph nodes. So we're using a special sensor, which is being manipulated inside with very fine movements. Um, you'll see that the counts go up. So we can include all of this in, in what the surgeon's seeing all in one image. So that, um, and then the lymph nodes found and that, and that can be used to target the dissection. Um, and there are other, so in, in, in this video, um, what I'm going to show you is another way that we use image overlay to demonstrate anatomical structures. So this patient, this is a laparoscopic procedure. They've been given an intravenous dye, which glows uh, under a certain wavelength, a bit like glow in the dark. When we switch the camera to a certain uh, view, you'll see the structure, which is going from the kidney to the bladder, transported in the urine along this tube called the ureter. Um, intraoperatively, we can use this fluorescence to help guide it. Uh, and then the next, we, we can use a composite image, which shows the normal anatomical structures with the fluorescence so that we can avoid this structure and protect it. Okay. And then, so ultimately what we want to do is combine all these techniques. That's where the future is. And, and this patient is a head and neck cancer patient who has had oper an operation at University College Hospital. And they've had all of the techniques that I've mentioned. So on the top left is one of their scans, which has had a 3D reconstruction on the left. And then they've, under, they've, they've gone on to have surgery, which has involved both the radioisotope dye used in the first um, video, and then um, also the fluorescence. And at the end, we can use the fluorescence to check that we've removed the correct piece of tissue. Um, probably I'll, I'll skip over this, but we're also using AI to monitor patients post-operatively with wearable tech so that their observations can be monitored. That means they can go home earlier and, and we might be able to detect complications sooner um, from reading things like their heart rate. And so, so what's next? Where do we go from here? Um, hospitals accrue enormous amounts of data. Um, all hospitals are on electronic notes now. 
and um, that creates vast sums of data that can that are too big for one person to analyze. So AI can be used to try and create prediction tools or risk calculators. There are new robotic platforms being used, uh, created all the time from other companies, um, and there are also procedure-specific robots now beginning to come out, and I think we'll certainly see them in endoscopy soon. And like I mentioned before, what the ultimate thing we want to do is combine all of these techniques so that they can be used um, in together um, to, to help with um, surgery or, or patient care. <coughs> And then lastly, what we want to talk about is what, what is the impact? What, what, is it, what difference will each one of these technologies make? And I, and I think it's important that we're careful with the language we use when we talk about new technology and that we don't emphasize its effect. It's obviously nice to have, um, but things are expensive and, and we have to prove that they're actually beneficial. That being said, nothing comes in leaps and bounds. Everything comes incrementally. So um, there will be periods where we introduce technology that only has a very limited benefit. And I think firstly, for cancer surgery, what we're mainly looking at is improved surgical safety and reduced complications rather than um, improving the cancer outcome, if you like, and, and the oncological outcome. That, that will take a lot longer to, to, to prove a benefit for. One of the limitations when we talk about artificial intelligence, particularly if things are autonomously refining themselves, is it can be difficult to work out um, how it's come to that conclusion, um, which uh, has certain issues around uh, liability and accountability for the decisions that are being made. And also new technology is extremely expensive. And I think really this is forms just one part of the cancer treatment pathway and the real survival benefits are going to come from uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and also um, personalized medicine from uh, genetic testing. Um, thanks very much. Um, these, I'd also like to acknowledge these people whose, whose work I've used in the presentation and um, look forward to any questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tom. And apologies to anyone who is squeamish and wasn't pre-warned that there would oh. be surgical, surgical content. No, no, not an issue. I mean, I love watching um, surgery videos, but that is part of my job to be interested in things like that. Um, so yes, please continue to pop questions in the Q&A and the chat, and we can come back to all of those at the end of the session. So Rima, are we ready to go? Yes, we are. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> not a problem at all. It happens to the best of us. So please, um, please take the floor. Lovely, thanks so much. Um, well, I've already been introduced, so thank you so much for having me. We'll go straight to the next slide, please. Okay, so in the area of bowel cancer, my work has had two main approaches, um, which I've undertaken in equal amounts. The first of which is um, training healthcare professionals who typically don't resemble the communities they're serving when they're working with minoritized groups. Also training community workers uh, in health inequalities and how to make their engagement more meaningful and more impactful. And my second line of work has been um, working directly in those minority communities to increase understanding of bowel cancer risk and the screening program. Um, and with regards to talking about health inequalities, it's just one of those topics, I guess, that can sometimes make people feel a little uncomfortable. But I just want to say, um, from the off that uh, I'm not here to tell you how to think and it's really okay to not know uh, all of what I'm talking about that's perfectly all right and also uh, I'm aware that this isn't a room full of healthcare professionals who are aiming to get out there and tackle health inequalities but all of you at some point you know to different degrees are having conversations about bowel health and all I ask is that you uh, share some of this information uh, from this presentation today if it makes sense um, and if enough of us are talking about it, we will change um, bowel health outcomes for people who don't have equal access to healthcare. So that's kind of my aim for today. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So because we have now the Core 20 plus five initiative in the NHS, equality, diversity and inclusion teams like mine are required to work uh, directly in health inequalities. And uh, my work in the EDI team covers uh, health inequalities for people who are accessing services uh, directly in communities and also in the workforce in the NHS. And uh, personally, my main areas of focus are race inequality, 
LGBTQ plus equality and disability equality. And uh, because of the short amount of time we have today, the two areas that I'm going to cover briefly um, are going to be race equality and LGBTQ plus equality. So these communities and some of the differences and how they access healthcare and how that's super relevant to Bell Health Outcomes. Thank you, next slide. Thanks. Okay, so first of all, we use different terms when talking about ethnic minority communities. We use BAME, BME, POC, people of color. Uh, and there isn't one term that everybody agrees on. So I just tend to use them all uh, so that everybody is equally offended. So apologies in advance, but I will use these terms uh, interchangeably. So we know that uh, there is low funding for projects that tackle bowel cancer risk in uh, in these uh, people of colour communities. And we know why this is happening. Funding is driven uh, by data. So the research we want to see isn't always possible because we don't have the data already. And what we do have already in terms of res research and data is that uh, we have this idea uh, and this evidence that bowel cancer risk in black and brown communities is low. And that may be so, but that's just now. And I will never stop pushing this particular issue because it's very, very clear to me what's going to happen. So in a few years, we will have a generation of people uh, who were born in the UK. We call them first generations in the UK. Um, and yes, they're black and brown, but they would have spent their entire lives living in areas of social deprivation with the same lifestyle issues associated with deprivation that we see in white communities. And their bowel cancer risk is going to be very similar. So to date, uh, when migration to the UK started, when the largest group settled in the UK, you know, according to where they came from, what their lifestyles have looked like, we have not yet seen the very, a very, very large first generation group of people in the UK who have lived their whole lives in social deprivation. Older black and brown people were not born here. Um, healthy migrant effect has always been a factor uh, or specific cultural and economic conditions that have meant that behaviours associated with health, healthy migrant effect have actually influenced others. And for anyone who is new to this term healthy migrant effect, it simply refers to the way that uh, it's the way that people lived before they moved here to the West. And it's important to remember that people did move to the West for a better quality of life. Um, for, for more wealth, for more affluence. But because they had things like scarcity of meat and dairy in their countries of origin, their diets tend to be plant-based, high fiber, minimally processed foods. Many people didn't own their own vehicles. So cycling and walking were the main modes of transport. UK data has shown us that many of these individuals who moved to the UK uh, have actually to date have long and healthy lifespans um, and these are the people that have actually influenced the data that we that we see in the UK in these groups. Some of their offspring have also adopted these healthy living habits. And in, as impressive as this is for these communities, historically, it has affected our perception of cancer risk in BME communities. But we must remember that this is going to change. And that's why I really want to keep these conversations on the table. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about how to reduce risk to black and brown communities or BAME communities, what we always come back to is the bowel screening program um, where this hasn't been so successful and how it could actually change bowel cancer outcomes if it were to be a successful program. So what we know has been known for a very long time. I just want to refresh people's memories on this. I mean, I'm sure you would have seen this particular part of my presentation many, many times before, but I'll just touch on it. So awareness is still lower in these communities. Um, this is because, for example, bodily function discussions aren't really, um, they're not really valued. Uh, they are kind of, they're kind of frowned upon still. Uh, young people can be the people, the ones that introduce health topics in families, because these are often the English speakers, even now in 2023. Um, so generic health campaigns that are aimed at everybody, uh, for example, 
COVID vaccination campaigns, uh, sugar level campaigns, blue jabs, these are going to be on the radar of younger people and passed on to their parents. But something like bowel screening isn't really going to be noticed by younger people. That could be a barrier to awareness for uh, people who are 50 and over. Um, trusting UK health systems and the NHS is still a problem. And this problem is getting worse uh, because of the slightly newer issues we have now, such as lower availability of GP appointments, um, low provision of interpreters, uh, the disproportionate number of black and brown people who were affected by um, the COVID-19 pandemic. We have racism in healthcare, which I think as a community, we're becoming more and more aware of. So for example, the healthcare professionals, the Snowy White Peaks report that came out has informed us that racism is a very, very real thing in healthcare. The general public, we see more reporting on black women um, and childbirth. Uh, mortality rates are much higher in black women and brown women compared to white women. Black men are more likely to be sectioned and, um, and are more likely to be um, more likely to receive a community treatment order when discharged. So we have some real differences racially there. And these all impact the way we feel about programs that are meant to help us. Um, and we have issues like the language support that's available for the, the bowel screening kit. I mean, this is great, but it's not doing enough. Why would you use it if you don't already know why this piece of kit is important? So if we're not primed, the person isn't primed in actually the value of this, they're not going to actually get somebody to support them to make that phone call. And sometimes people don't always have someone to support them to make that initial phone call, uh, to be able to find uh, someone to, to speak with in different languages. Cultural views on handling feces is still an issue. It's slowly changing, but uh, tolerance of this idea is very low. The FOBT kit is the one that people still remember. People are still talking about with disgust in communities. Uh, the FIT test, um, it's gonna take a long time before people realize that the kit has changed. It's cleaner, there's no storage of it. It's a single sample kit um, and it's more accurate. So we need to, really kind of either push, push, push for that information or wait for it to, to be spread organically in communities. Uh, and faith is a big part of people of colour communities and people do cling to their faith during times of hardship. And living in the UK is all about hardship for, uh, for ethnic minority people. So sometimes faith gives us fatalistic ideas that actually we don't have full control of our health. There's not much we can do to change our health outcomes. All of these things are predetermined. Next slide, please. So what's needed to reduce um, bowel cancer risk in BAME communities? So we've known for a long time that uh, a lot of ethnic minority groups aren't using the screening program in high numbers. But despite this, efforts to achieve uh, equality in screening are sporadic, underfunded, and lack creativity. We have to ask the question, why is this? So we know that bowel cancer, um, the prevalence is higher in white people, sure. But we also know, and we've always known, that there is a large number of cases uh, every year that uh, are related to lifestyle. So at the moment, I think it's 54%. Um, and we know that uh, black and brown communities are struggling to climb the social ladder. So for example, uh, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, Caribbeans and black Africans their health is lagging behind as a result of this social inequality in general, again highlighted by the COVID pandemic. So why are we not doing enough to change this? In a society that's still underpinned by white supremacist values or bias towards white people, probably being the more palatable language, it's really vital that we stop seeing black and brown lives as disposable. To tackle these biases, we need a robust, anti-racism strategy in healthcare. Only when we individually challenge our own views can we bring about true race equality and inclusivity to our health inequalities work. Next slide, please. So if we're designing screening uh, uptake interventions, which is what we need to be doing uh, more frequently, uh, we know that some groups are not using the screening program. Uh, the letter, the invitation isn't working. So many factors aren't working. Uh, 
for all of you on the call who might be interested in volunteering or working on initiatives that improve screening uptakes and, uh, and bowel health outcomes in minority groups, your time and labour can actually make a huge difference, as hopefully I can demonstrate with some examples of bits that I've worked on in the past. Uh, so in the bowel cancer charity that I worked at, uh, most of the volunteers were white middle class people and they'd never worked in health inequalities before. But they quickly understood uh, that their initiatives, that initiatives were needed. They needed to be targeted, tailored, cost effective and needed to have the right people on board. Uh, they needed to be set for a specific time and outcomes needed to be measured. Next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, when one of the bigger projects that I worked on, and when I was asked to come along and talk about uh, some of my work today, this was the, the piece of research that people really wanted to, me to speak about. So this was a partnership project um, between Bowel Cancer UK uh, and Community African Network. And it was a, an 18 month long program, a very, very long piece of work. Um, and you can see here, actually, we've got a photo of uh, a volunteer who was very young, uh, also white, training local volunteers in uh, bowel cancer risk in communities, specific risk in communities, also the bowel screening program, um, and also a bit about what it takes to create a meaningful engagement when we're going out into the community. So we trained uh, 40 local volunteers who had experience in talking about what you might say, I guess, stigmatized topics in the community, things like HIV and AIDS, uh, things like domestic violence. They had some experience on board. We did two rounds of training with them um, and then put them in different places. And they did extraordinary work over the 18 months and actually were able to have huge impact. Next slide, please. So a little bit about, yeah, you can see for yourself uh, the objectives, the outcomes and the outputs that we that we worked on. Um, in addition to the uh, putting, uh, having volunteers in GP surgeries, having them on market stalls in very, very uh, high traffic places in the community in Hackney, we had them in Ridley Road and uh, Kingsland Market as well. Um, we had volunteers working in parents' evenings, workshops in places of worship, in community centers. Um, what we found after 18 months, and we were working to demonstrate to the CCG that actually it's really worth investing in community-based projects. Um, what we found was actually a 9% increase in bowel screening in black African communities, which was, Absolutely huge, considering uh, the very, very low uptake that we already saw in Black African communities. Um, next slide, please. This is an ex this is basically what the awareness would look like. We'd have a, a simple uh, stall. People would have bowel screening kits that uh, just call people from the streets, often speak to them in a language that they would understand or a dialect they would understand. Um, they would not use complex language in a way that some of us may when we work in awareness. They made it very, very simple. Um, they attached values to this work that were relatable within that community. Um, so it may not be about, this is about scientific data, but it could be about this is something that we need to do for our families to make sure that we're around longer. Um, and this is not about uh, messing around with feces. This is just something um, that can be over very, very quickly. Uh, and it can be very hygienic if we if we get it right. You know, if we, if we think it through as a community, it doesn't have to be dirty or disgusting. Those kind of conversations that meant something to people in the community. And as I mentioned, 9%, uh, that was huge. Next slide, please. I um, just want to touch on some other bits that I did uh, that were very impactful, we thought. So this was one uh, for the Gujarati community, and they really are light years ahead of other communities when it comes to um, health and their internal health education system. So as a group, culturally, they're... Um, they're already doing things like walking, swimming, yoga, uh, just because it's so deeply embedded in, in, in their values. They already have largely plant-based diets. They wanted to know about how they could improve their bowel health. 
you know, how can they really reduce risk of all bowel conditions? So we said, we'll come in and do a, an hour talk. And they said, no, we want to have two hours. We can bring 500 people in the community. We have these health meetings so often. So we did it. And um, we, we look at specifically their cultural diets, which were great, but how could we improve them? How can we improve um, the type of exercise they're doing? Um, and they fully committed as a group to, to using the guidance that we provided. Next slide, please. Um, other small examples here and there, uh, a Bengali Mothers Club we went to and did uh, a one hour session on bowel health and, and screening. Also a pop-up shop. I mean, really you can use any space uh, where you know you're gonna have high footfall, you're going to have people who are living uh, in social deprivation, people who may not have the level of education that we have, uh, people who you can, you can kind of attract their interest by offering them something small and free, like a free health check. You can offer them a bit of free fruit or veg or some cereal bars or some, some bottled water. Um, sometimes people really, really want to just have a conversation with someone because they haven't had one for a while or just do something different to change their health. There's a, a picture of an awareness piece I did in a mosque. Um, that was really quite challenging, actually, um, especially with the gender differences and uh, who was considered an expert sometimes in different cultures. Uh, but they did let me in and I did. I was given uh, 20 minutes to speak on um, on the bowel screening program and they agreed to pass on these messages um, in their um, in their times of worship. Uh, next slide, please. Another one here that we did uh, for Deaf Achieve. Honestly, the deaf community in the UK are so, so um, tapped in to, to health inequalities and actually what they could do differently as a community. And one of the groups that I've enjoyed working with the most have been deaf people. They are very, very quick to bring in interpreters and they really, really want as much information as you can, as you can provide. And what's really understood about the deaf community is that the reading ability can be quite low. So when something like a bowel screening program um, booklet comes through or the, the kit itself, they're not necessarily going to understand what to do with that. If you give them a leaflet, it's not going to be straightforward for them to read it. This obviously refers to congenitally deaf people. Um, but what can be really helpful is if you give them uh, a guide that is, say, aimed for someone of a lower reading age or with a learning disability, or you bring in um, an interpreter and really break that information down for them. Next slide, please. Uh, this was an awareness piece that, again, was very, very hard to, to do. But I disagree with this expression, hard to reach. Nobody is hard to reach. We just need to try either a bit harder or we need to try doing things differently. I think it took me two days to get a place um, in this particular event. Uh, the Islamic Fair of Bristol happens every year. There are um, 10,000 Muslims attending this. And we know that Muslims have the most difficult diet when it comes to bowel health. Um, they have high meat diets, low whole grain, low fruit and veg, and low exercise, particularly with the women in the community. So it's really, really important that we go to events that are for um, Indian Muslims, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, um, and just general Muslim events overall. Um, and, you know, we involved the children, we made it a family event, we made it fun, it was like a game show. And in the end, people did take some information home with them. Um, and I thought, yeah, we, we did some evaluation and people did agree that they wanted to at least change some of their lifestyle habits. Next slide, please. Um, this was a picture, a couple of pictures of uh, the health care professionals training slide that I mentioned. We trained um, community connectors and, uh, and nurses in uh, the Peaceborough and Cambridge area for Cambridge uh, CCG. And it was a joint venture with Bowel Cancer UK, Cancer Research UK and Joe Cervical Cancer Trust. We covered uh, breast, cervical and bowel in two very, very long days. Um, and it was wonderful to have the two types of worker there. The community connectors were able to share their knowledge about communities. Um, and we were able to talk about cancer and um, the nurses were able to talk more about how they personally go about their engagement. And we, we were able to influence that quite a lot. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so as I mentioned, I wanted to talk about two groups today, and I've called these slides Rethinking Cancer Risk in Minority Groups, because I really don't like this idea of we only have this data available, so that's where we're going to put all our, our efforts and our, our funding, because really we are going to see generations in the very near future with really, really high cancer risk, and we've done nothing about it, so what can we do now? based on what we already know. So I'm just briefly, before I finish up, going to talk about, so I'll just skim over some of the issues affecting the LGBTQ plus community. So uh, LGBTQ plus community or queer people, as we are known very positively now, make up um, over 10% of the population. And, um, and participation in research is quite low due to safety issues. People don't want to be known, um, particularly for the trans community who make up 1% on paper. In reality, it's a lot more than that. Now, the political climate at the moment for the queer community is very challenging, uh, particularly for trans people. Um, as we know, uh, the, the rollback of trans rights is an issue now. Um, and lots of us are campaigning against that. But how is this all relevant to bowel health? So first of all, uh, the LGBTQ plus community are a group with a unique set of needs. Uh, there are more serious outcomes for LGBTQ plus people of color and trans people of any ethnicity. And uh, in my line of work, I work with trans people on a daily basis in the community uh, as patients and service users and in the workforce too. And all of my uh, conversations and observations completely align with research findings. Um, so what we know uh, is that the LGBTQ plus community are at uh, are an at-risk group, they're a vulnerable group, and trans people are uh, known to be in crisis with their health right now. And if communities are living on the fringes of society due to discrimination, and this is evident from the issues experienced in this community uh, in employment, housing, healthcare, um, they have reduced the ability to look after their physical health needs because the other aspects of their existence are so challenging. Their cancer risk, uh, in addition to being, to having, sorry, their uh, ability to engage in cancer prevention behaviors such as 150 minutes of exercise per week is reduced uh, because they have so many other issues that they are trying to tackle in their own lives. And um, we know that levels of disability are really, really high in the trans community. Levels of neurodivergence are really high in the trans community. We're just starting to see the research in these areas. Uh, and also to further emphasize the point, and I really want to uh, touch on this study, a 2019 study by Werner et al. Uh, Non-surgical cancer doctors were asked about their knowledge of and attitudes uh, to the LGBTQ plus patients they were, um, they were seeing. Results showed that between uh, that 3% uh, and 3 to 5% of participants did not feel prepared, sorry, 3 to 5% of participants felt prepared to meet the needs of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and most of them, the majority, really wanted this type of training to be mandatory in healthcare. So this feels quite serious. This is a whole group of doctors who feel ill-equipped to deal with patients who are LGBTQ plus and, uh, and trans. Next slide, please. Hi, Rima. I'm so sorry to rush you during this really important topic, but we're going to need to kind of whiz through the next slide so we can fit in no our next speaker before the end of the session. Sorry, Thank thanks. You. Absolutely fine. Thank you so much. Um, so let me see what I can just quickly touch on. So yeah, research for the past seven years are telling us the very same thing. Um, what we... Uh, so trans people are disengaging from healthcare because they have extensive experience of discrimination, microaggressions, uh, and so on when they do uh, speak to doctors and healthcare professionals. So if they are disengaging when they have their bowel screening kits or if they have symptoms, uh, would they recognize them as symptoms? Would they do anything about it? Uh, if they know that a colonoscopy is something that they are going to have to have, are they actually going to book that? Um, it, it's 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 very very worrying, uh, especially when they they aren't really trusting the NHS because gender affirming healthcare, which is recognised widely as life saving healthcare, it takes between it can take up to ten years to access this for an individual. Um, so yeah, when we have things like polyps and early cancers, they are not going to be detected. Next slide, please. 
thanks. I'll, I'll just wrap up with this one. So what we do need is to see representation when we uh, have marketing and campaigns around bowel health uh, and screening. We need to see uh, trans inclusion training uh, from the very first point of contact through the bowel um, the colonoscopy process. And we also need to see it in the follow up care. We need to keep trans people engaged throughout by making sure that every interaction is trans inclusive. People aren't misgendering people. Uh, people aren't dead naming people, uh, which can be really traumatic for trans people. Uh, final slide, please. This is just one example of something we did, which was uh, with Bowel Cancer UK and Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust, attending London Pride, marching in the parade, giving out Z cars, which were called anyone with a cervix. It was a trans inclusive piece of work to bring people onto the into the screening program who had a cervix, whether they were a cisgender woman or a trans man, because many trans men still have their cervix intact. So if we can do this with cervical cancer, what can we do differently in the queer community with bowel health? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rima, for speaking on those incredibly important topics. We, we're really thankful that you could join us today to share all of your knowledge about these, um, these issues. So now we're going to move on to Eamon Dunn. And Eamon is the Partnerships and Project Development Manager at the Thomas Pocklington Trust. Thomas Pocklington Trust is a national charity which supports blind and partially sighted people. Eamon has a special focus on ensuring equity of access and quality of experience for blind and partially sighted people when using health care and support services. So Eamon, we're delighted that you could join us today and over to you. <clears throat> thanks, Georgia, and, and thanks, Rima, for that brilliant presentation. That was really interesting. Um, and actually, what I'm going to talk about dovetails nicely onto that. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to not uh, not dilly dally and crack on. So, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, so, I'm just about to share my screen. Uh, let me just do that now. Hopefully, that will work. Is that oh, no, wrong? Wrong mouse. I've got two two mice going at the moment. So it's okay. That's done. Right. Um, can everybody see the presentation? Yes, we can see. Fantastic. Right, I'll just start the slideshow. Right, okay. So, yeah, so I, I, as Georgie said, my role is around health um, equity of access to all of health and social care. In the past, as a sector, we've concentrated a lot on eye health pathway, but not how people with sight loss access the whole of the rest of health and social care, which is like a really big thing to do. But that's what we're doing now. So that's important. And that's my main focus of my role. So uh, the health equity bit, as I, get, I guess, is the bit where we come into this, or health inequalities. There's all sorts of different ways of, of describing it, but basically um, that's what I'm focusing on. So I'll just uh, get the screen up. And my slideshow has gone off again. Right. So what I'm going to talk about briefly is um, <clears throat> what the NHS Bile Cancer Screening Programme is, which you probably know about anyway, so I won't go draw too much on that. Uh, what the FIT test is and what's involved, what problems does the VIT test pose for people with, who are blind and partially sighted? Uh, and what can be done to solve these access problems to, to the kit? Um, and how are we, at Thomas Buckingham's Trust, and the RNIB and our other partners looking to tackle these inequalities or inequities? Okay, so moving on. So the uh, screening and FIT test. Well, the VIT test most people know about the, um, the NHS Bowel Cancer Screening Programme checks for science bowel cancer is available to everybody between the ages of 60 and 74. So a home test kit called the uh, FIT test or the Fecal Immunochemical Test, uh, difficult for me to say, uh, it collects a small amount of poo and you send it to the lab and this is checked for tiny amounts of blood. Uh, and then you get the results back in the post to let you know uh, whether you're clear or there are uh, as a need for follow-up. Um, so bowel cancer is the fourth most common why to keep doing that? My uh, slides have just come back to that. Uh, bowel cancer is the fourth most common type of cancer. So screening can help prevent bowel cancer or find it at an early stage when it's easier to treat. Um, I said before it's 60 to 74, but actually it's expanding now and will be available to people from the age of 50. So that's going to take a little few years to, to, um, to get in place. But nevertheless, that's, that's happening. And I've been um, a beneficiary of that actually already. So this is the kit. Again, many of you have probably seen this kit. It, uh, you get a letter in the post before it comes to tell you it's coming and um, to ask you if you need any reasonable adjustments, if you like, Or but then if you can't read that letter, that's a bit of an issue. So that's something I'll touch on in a minute. So you do the test, you put it in a nice discreet little cardboard envelope and post it back, I don't know, a week or so. 
or some variation on the timing, you will get some results back. So pretty good, really. And it's all free, which, you know, when you look at other countries and the costs of, of things like this, it's actually, why wouldn't you do it? Um, okay, so what are the challenges then? So if you are visually impaired, um, it's not so easy to use this kit. But before uh, I do that, there's actually too many people in the UK that do live with sight loss. So it's quite more, a lot more than people think, actually. Because many of those people might not be obviously visually impaired. They don't have a cane or they don't, you know, they don't have a guide dog, but they're living with a sight deficit. And actually 80% of that 2 million people are over 65. So they're more likely to suffer with multiple health conditions um, like, like bowel cancer and others. Um, and not being able to see the kit or the instruction renders the kit effectively useless for BI people and those with dexterity challenges, uh, such as arthritis. Um, to help with this, sorry, I'll have, to get, I'll have to keep clicking back on my slide. To help with this, um, the accessible information standard um, is, is a, and some of you again, you will know about this, but and the reasonable adjustment flag is supposed to identify people with a particular communication need um, so that they can have reasonable adjustments made for them. This was introduced in 2016, but we found out that recently from our research that up to 90% of people with sight loss are still not getting communications from the NHS and social care in the right format. So that's something we're campaigning on. Um, and again, you know, if 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 they, those people cannot be identified, then no adjustments will be made for them and they might not actually respond to the test because they can't use it. Um, and the NHS screening database, I found out recently, doesn't actually connect with the NHS spine as yet. So even if you do have your reasonable adjustments notified to NHS, um, when it comes to the, the health screening database, it doesn't pick up that. So it's got to start from scratch with getting feedback from people who maybe had the test sent and said, you know, phone the number and said, I can't use the test. What am I going to do? So what are the solutions? Um, so uh, the, the FIT test, which I talked about before and showed you a picture of, we are looking at a, a new test or, or an adapted test called the FIT aid. So it, it's, you know, obviously it's more accessible because that's what we're, we're looking at. Um, and it's currently in a testing phase. So I've got, but I've got a picture of it here. So for those who are familiar with the conventional FIT test, which is, uh, uh, you know, is a lot better than the older tests that used to be available, but they're still not that accessible for people with sight loss. But this, this new test, which again is, is currently being tested by people with sight loss who are of the age of, of screening, um, it's got like a channel. Hang on, we'll have to get that back up again. It's got a channel in the middle, so the sort of test tube thing can be placed there and the, the, the sort of applicator can be pushed in um, because actually it's, when you can't see, it's very difficult to get that applicator back in the tube. There are braille instructions and there are also there is also a QR code so that people can get a link to order audio instructions and a, a sort of audio described video. And there are large instructions on there as well. So, so it's it's still in testing. So the idea is that once this um, once this is available, those who are identified as having sight loss when the accessible information standard works um, will be sent to this adapted kit. Um, so that the, we think there'll be a huge, you know, hugely greater response rate. And there will also be some publicity. Our sector will do some of that publicity to make sure that all the people that we're connected with um, and who have sight loss are made aware of, of this kit and, you know, asked if they need any additional support. And again, once the IT systems are better, we'll be able to flag people, not, not have to kind of um, try and fix it, the problem after it's, after it's, um, after it's started. Um, the other thing really is about continue, you know, we've got lots of our uh, people that we connect with called sight loss councils, who are people with lived experience who work across England at 20 different areas now, working with service dividers. Quite a few of them are working with NHS bodies in Bristol and in Birmingham to look at how all of their services can be made more accessible and provide training and other resources. We, we're fortunate enough as our charities and endow charity, so we don't have to fundraise. We, we have a, a reasonable amount of funding that we can we can bring to partnerships in, if there's anything in, in terms of resources that are needed. Uh, sorry, but again. Um, and then we've got our, our campaign, which is Make Health Accessible, and this is part of that campaign. And it, it's about making sure that, um, for example, people uh, doing their training in nurses or nursing or social work or OT or midwifery, any of those professions that make up the health um, professionals body are actually trained um, during their training about uh, awareness of people with sight loss and how they can make the interaction more accessible and and and, um, and and create better outputs from that really so that's everything from technical systems to the way people talk to people 
and um, that are guided through the kind of physical um, health spaces that exist. So that's kind of really enough for me to say for now. Um, get in touch with me. My contact details, I'm sure, will be shared. But, um, you know, if anyone's got any questions after this, you know, because I, I appreciate time is short, uh, or you have an interest in anything to do with sight loss whatsoever, not just uh, bowel cancer screening, please do get in touch. Uh, okay, that's I'm, I'm more or less done. That Was that quick enough? <laughs> that was wonderful. Thanks so much, Eamon. So we have a couple of uh, questions for our panellists. Um, so I, I believe the first one is for Tom. So I think it relates to one of the videos you showed. So why was the liver covered in that kind of net animation if it wasn't cancerous? Uh, it's really just to showcase the technology. So one of the things that um, some things in the abdomen are fixed, some things move um, and some things are partly fixed and can move and the liver is one of those so whereas the bowel can move anywhere and flop around if you like the liver is fixed at several points so actually it's quite a good um, structure to demonstrate the technology and also it has an underlying vascular anatomy within the liver which we would want to manipulate with our AI model so that's just why we've chosen that but it could be it could be done with anything. Amazing okay and then one question which um is it could be open to all of the groups. So why is there a view that people over 75 are excluded from the NHS screening programme? I can, um, I think, I mean, I, these, you other guys might be in a better position to talk about it, but um, they, I guess they're not technically, you can ask to be, to continue screening. Um, and it's really just based upon research, um, which will be partly engagement, partly the results, and also partly the efficacy of the screening program. Um, so it's got to be cost effective and, and easy to do. And if people aren't engaging with it, then we stop using it. Um, it's like the same way that with polyp surveillance. So if you have a colonoscopy and you have polyps, polyps grow so slowly, we tend to not um, provide any surveillance after people are 75. And it's not an age cutoff. It's a time of how long polyps takes to turn into bowel cancer cutoff. That's a really helpful answer. Thank you. Oh, Eamon, did you have something to add to that? There's a uh, people over 75, again, are far more likely to have visual impairment. So there's a natural kind of, I don't want to say excluded, but like um, they are effect effectively excluded to some extent. But that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing, really, to kind of tackle it from, from that end, you know. Mm. Great. Um, well, if there are no more um, questions, I'll give people kind of one one more minute maybe to send in their questions. Um, but yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers in the bowel cancer session. Um, you've all had such valuable things to contribute and they've all been super interesting presentations. So yeah, thank you on behalf of Bowel Research UK for joining us today and I will hand back over to Sam.